Uh, what's up, church? <laughs> well, the place where a couple first meets is significant. Where'd you guys meet? Uh, we met in a hiking group. We met back in college. We met, introduced to each other at a party. We went out on a blind date. We met in a redemption community. <laughs> hey, that's right. <laughs> Warren's trying to help you out here. Hey, redemption <laughs> community. <laughs> the place where a couple of verse meets is significant. We have some iconic scenes and images of this in our culture. So Romeo and Juliet lock in eyes for the first time at the dance, and where it's love at first sight. Or Sleepless in Seattle, where there's more of a gradual process that culminates in this encounter at the Empire State Building. The place where a couple first meets is significant. This is often a place that many will choose as the site to propose if time comes for the wedding proposal. I know for Holly and I, this was our story, I proposed to Holly at Old Laurelhurst Church, the place where we first met. Old Laurelhurst Church was an old, kind of historic Spanish-style church, a wedding chapel in the heart of uh, Portland, and it had kind of the stained glass windows, the beautiful, gorgeous, high-vaulted architecture ceilings. And that was where we met. We happened to sit down next to each other in the pews one Sunday at church. So when the time came later to propose, I decided this is where it's going to take place. And as Holly and I showed up, and she thought, you know, we were dressed to the nines, all fancy. She thought we were going to meet some friends for a fancy dinner afterwards, but I tricked her, suckered her in. (laughs) But as we burst through those big old wooden doors, she was shocked to find over 100 lit candles Uh, that I had had my friend light just before we got there. And the stained glass lit up by spotlights from the outside. And three uh, friends up in the balcony on like cello and violin and strings bursting into a symphony. My buddy Steve, the photographer, hiding in the balcony, taking pictures of the whole deal. And she thought we'd walked in on somebody's wedding ceremony. (laughs) She was was like, dude, we gotta get out of here. We gotta go. I'm like, no, this this is for you. And as we walked down the aisle and she saw at the front, dozen roses and the diamond glistening up at the center. But the reason, yeah, thanks. Wow, thank you. (laughs) I did all right. I did all right. (laughs) But the reason I chose this location for the proposal was because it was where we had first met. It had the special significance for us as a couple. Well, today, we're going to be looking at a picture of Christ as the groom encountering his church, the bride, for the first time. As we're going to see the location where this scene takes place is significant. We are in John 4, uh, continuing our series on John. So if you have a Bible and you want to turn there, that would be great. If you don't, you got your phone, you can pull up your Bible app. Uh, Often, normally, we love to hand out Bibles uh, for those who don't have them. But uh, because of COVID, we're not doing that right now. If you need a Bible after after the service, feel free to grab one from the back. We'd love to give you one. Just come and talk to us. We'd love to give you a free Bible. We're in John 4, and this is a famous story of the woman at a well, right? the woman at a well. And on one level, this story is a real encounter, Jesus and this woman and this conversation they have, and yet on another level, this scene is iconic of a greater reality, that the details John emphasizes, the way he narrates the story, he wants to draw our attention to going, this scene is like an icon, it's like a stained glass window that you look through and get this bigger transcendent picture of Christ encountering us as his church for the first time. For as we're going to see, the well is a significant meeting place in the Bible. It's a significant location where the groom meets his bride. So the title for the message this morning is Boy Meets Girl. So maybe give a wink to your neighbor and say, what's up? (laughs) Just don't ask for their number. That would be awkward. (laughs) All right, John 4, let's start in verse 1. It says, Now, when Jesus learned the Pharisees uh, had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John the Baptist, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour, or noon. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. 
The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. I'll stop there for a moment. The first thing that we see here is that Jesus goes to the wrong side of town. Jesus goes to the wrong side of town to find his bride. Now, the scene opens with the temple leadership, the religious folks, they're quarreling over, fighting over the color of the church carpet and which movement's better, which one's right, and Jesus is just not interested in that conversation. So he skips town. He leaves the religious crowd and he goes to Samaria. And we read here that he had to go to Samaria. Only Jesus didn't actually have to go to Samaria. As a matter of fact, Jewish people in the day, they avoided Samaria at all costs. People would go out of their way to go miles around if they needed to, to avoid going into Samaria. And why? Why was there so much bad blood between Samaritans and Jewish people? Well, back in the day, back in history, when uh, Israel had been conquered by uh, the Assyria, a foreign power, uh, the people in Samaria had intermarried with uh, the, the oppressors. They had, had uh, blended their religious practices, and so they had elements of Judaism with these other pagan religious practices of their oppressors. And so they were seen by the Jewish people as compromisers. They had compromised with the system. Right? So good, upstanding Jewish boys looked down upon Samaritans as quote-unquote half-breed pagans. And to speak of them as Samaritans, they were part Jew, part Gentile, both in their identity and in their practice. And so there was both a religious and a racial component to this disdain. Jews would go around Samaria, but Jesus goes through. Jesus had to go to Samaria. Not because Google Maps said there was no alternative route, but he had to go to Samaria because you were there and he comes looking for his bride. Right? He had a divine appointment he had to meet with someone there that he was coming for. We find that Jesus goes places that the upright and the uptight don't like to go. Right? Jesus goes on vacation in Juarez, Mexico, the drug and murder capital. <laughs> Jesus is playing pickup games in South Side Chicago, dangerous. <laughs> Jesus is hanging out at Mill Avenue at 2 a.m. with the drunk and the wasted. And why does he go there? Because you're there. And he goes looking for his bride. Okay. Well, when he gets there, we read that Jesus sits down by a well. Jacob's well, as a matter of fact. And the well is significant. If we zoom out into the biblical story as a whole, the well is a significant image. It is a place where the groom meets their bride. If you go to Genesis 24 and the story of Isaac and Rebekah, and Rebekah is first discovered at the well. If you go to Genesis 29 and Jacob and Rachel, and Jacob first locks eyes with Rachel and falls head over heels at a well. If you go to Exodus 2, Moses first encounters Zipporah in this rescue scene at a well. Robert Alter is a famous Jewish uh, commentator, and he remarks on this that the well is the scene for a betrothal, what they call a type scene, a motif throughout the Bible. And he observes, it keeps showing up in other stories throughout the Old Testament, and he says, when it happens, it has these elements. One, the future groom journeys to a foreign land, as Jesus does here. Two, there he encounters a girl at a well, as Jesus does here. Three, one of them draws water from the well, as we're about to see in the ensuing conversation here is about. Four, the girl then rushes to bring home news of the stranger's arrival, as we're going to see at the end of this passage. And finally, five, a betrothal is concluded after he has been invited to a, a meal. We're going to see Jesus here invited to a meal to stay with the Samaritans for a few days. So all these elements are in this passage. Jesus echoes a number of these scenes. We read that Jesus says that he sat down by the well. That echoes Moses. Uh, it's the same phrase used. Moses comes and he sits down by the well. When it says, Jesus says, give me a drink, that's the same phrase that said to Rebecca at the well. And the point for all this is John is emphasizing these details. He wants us to see this as not only this encounter between Jesus and this Samaritan woman, but that this is like an iconic stained glass window, a picture into a greater reality of Christ encountering his bride for the first time. This is the place where the couple first meets. Now, the Samaritan woman here is a picture of the church. 
Like her, the church is both Jew and Gentile, like the Samaritan woman. The church has a scandalous past, like the Samaritan woman. And the church encounters Jesus as the one who has journeyed and crossed the greatest boundary from a distant land, ultimately coming from heaven to earth to encounter and meet us as his people. We discover here that Jesus is the great boundary crosser. Can somebody say boundary crosser? Boundary Boundary crosser. That's right. Jesus crosses any boundary he needs to to get to us as his people. We see here that Jesus crosses boundaries of geography, of ethnicity, of gender, of morality, of reputation. He crosses whatever he needs to to get to us as his bride. Jesus is a fence jumper. Like me and my friends in high school going places we weren't supposed to go. Jesus is an Olympic athlete. He's hopping over all these hurdles like they're speed bumps, right? Like they're nothing. Jesus, it's like Taco Bell in the 80s, right? He's making a run for the border, right? Right? The Samaritan border, so he can leap over it. And the reason he does all this is to get to the church as his bride. Jesus is the boundary crosser. Christ pursues a church who some may say lives in the wrong zip code, is of the wrong ethnicity, has a bad morality, has a stained reputation. Christ pursues a church who has often been rejected and disrespected and seen as having had a corrupted lifestyle or a tainted past. But Jesus says, ha, that's nothing for me. I'm the great boundary crosser. My question for us, kind of reflecting on this this week, is asking this, are we spending more time creating dividing lines or crossing them? Are we, church, spending more time creating dividing lines or crossing them? Because there are a lot of dividing lines. There are a lot of boundaries uh, being established for us today. So uh, I was watching the new Netflix uh, Netflix documentary, Social Dilemma, recently. And uh, there it was looking at themes like social media and some of the unintended consequences and impact it's having. And one of these that struck me as interesting is that we are increasingly, algorithms are learning how to feed us the information that we already want to hear, which means it is reinforcing boundaries in how we think, isolating us in our own echo chamber where the news stories that come in, the ads that pop up, the things that we receive are increasingly reinforcing our own perception of the world. You may not have asked for it, I didn't ask for it, but it's the world that we live in, of boundaries that are being established. There are also boundaries to where we live. It's interesting looking at geographical studies on zip codes and how the people in your neighborhood tend to have roughly the same amount of education and wealth as you. There are what some have called the super zips, or the super zip codes, meaning that if you have an Ivy League education, chances are about three quarters of the people in your neighborhood do as well. There are geographic boundaries that you may not have asked for, I may not have asked for, but have been established for us. There are boundaries of age in our society. Increasingly, different demographics are parceled out and sort of pushed, or not like a person is pushing us, but there are uh, things that bring us into a space where we tend to be with people who are in the same sort of age demographic as us. And particularly for us as a predominantly younger congregation, it's happening going, how many elderly people do you know? That's you. How many people who are older do you know? And all this, it strikes me, the intentionality that it's going to take today to cross boundaries, to be like Jesus as we follow him. And it raises the question, are you and I, are we willing to be a boundary crosser? I was struck this week, I was listening to a podcast um, with, uh, they were interviewing uh, this guy I know, a theologian I love, his name is J. Todd Billings. And Todd Billings, he has terminal cancer, so he's uh, dying of cancer, and he's written this great new book, The End of the Christian Life, reflecting on our Christian mortality, or on our mortality, and going how, reflecting on our mortality in light of the cross, it frees us to truly live. And one of the things he was observing in this is uh, this whole host of studies that have been done, uh, over 100 studies cross-culturally that are exploring what happens to us as people when we see images of death, when we hear themes of death, even if it's not like explicit or graphic, even if it's just subtle in the background, when these kind of themes come up. And what they have found is that by and large, we go tribal. That when themes of death uh, come up out there, and we probably feel threatened, that we go inward and we kind of go, okay, who are my people, who are, who's my group, who's my crew, and we put up the boundary walls in defensiveness. 
But Billings goes, there's uh, an alternative. Often those who have suffered greatly, who have come to grips with their mortality, and there's ways they look at that, have the opposite effect, that in the midst of themes like this, they turn outward and go, how can I give and serve love during this season? And it struck me, listening to that, someone was, you know, asking kind of, man, what, you know, looking at this year, it feels like we're very tribalized, polarized, divided today. And it just struck me that, man, this year has felt like the perfect storm, right? Where early in the year, we have months of the theme of COVID and themes of death and the fear of death and the need for masks and for quarantine and all these things um, that, that are taking place. But in our society, what better way to prime the pump to go inward to go tribal, to go, who's my crew, who's on the outside? And all this leading into the season of an election season and ideological camps. And in the midst of this church, I want to say thank you for the way that you have walked through this season. I have loved seeing in the King of Kings campaign we've been in to see Jim and Warren and others who've talked about kind of these four quadrants that we tend to identify ourselves with today, the leanings that we have, but the way uh, that, that you have pressed into life with one another, staying at the table and pressing into life with Jesus together. That this doesn't mean that, uh, or even the political discipleship groups they've started where folks from different leanings, different trajectories are coming together and going, what's common ground that we can work together on here in our community, in our city, to build a better place together as God's people? And this doesn't mean that we have no convictions, but it does mean we don't have to agree to love. We don't have to agree to love. And so I believe as we follow Christ, the invitation is for us to be boundary crossers, that we would go to those who think different than us, look different from us, act different from us, vote different from us, post different from us, live different from us, that we would be boundary crossers to go sit down by the well and invite conversation. And the reason we can do this It's because, church, the only reason that we're in it to begin with is because Jesus crossed the greatest of boundaries, coming from heaven to earth and even further, going all the way to hell and back to be with us forever as his bride. Okay, so let's keep going. We're going to pick up now in verse 10. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with. I love that. It's like, you got no bucket. (laughs) And the well is deep. Your arms ain't that long, Jesus. (laughs) Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Are you greater than Jacob? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. We find here that Jesus is the thirst quencher who can quench your greatest thirst. Jesus offers her living water. He's like, can I have a drink? She's like, what are you doing asking me for a drink? You don't even have a bucket. And he's like, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me. Jesus asking you for water. That's like Bill Gates walking up to you and being like, hey, can I borrow 10 bucks? <laughs> you know? Or the barefoot Contessa showing up at your house and being like, could you cook me a snack? You know? <laughs> Jesus offers you and I, he offers you something that greater than what you have to offer him. I found often we get into Christianity thinking, man, okay, I'm going to get my life right. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to give him my things. I'm going to bring him all I got, and then, then he'll be happy with me. But when you get in and you get the gospel, you find we've had it backwards. That ultimately what the gospel is about is what Christ has come to offer you. And what he has to offer us is so much greater than anything we could ever offer in return. And ours is simply offered back in gratitude and in worship. We get into the gospel and we find, man, it's actually what he wants to pour into me, what he wants to give me. Now, what does Jesus want to give us? Well, it says here he wants to give us living water. Living water was an ancient term for river water. So if you think about like a a pond, let's say, versus a river, where a pond is stationary, it can go stagnant and stale, there can be mosquitoes and algae and all the muddy, that kind of stuff in it. 
Compare that, though, to a river, and a river is like living water. It feels like it's alive, it's rushing, it's staying clean, and it's bringing life, crops, fruitfulness, abundance to the land. I saw the power of this when Holly and I spent some time in Congo and Liberia back in the day, and uh, some communities where uh, all they had was a pond for water, but there were mosquitoes and parasites, there was a lot of illness and sickness and even death that would come from that being the only source of drinking water. And the power and difference that was made when a well came in that was tapping way down deep into underwater reservoirs, and then health changed, life changed. People went from surviving to thriving. Many have said that clean water is like a foundation for uh, health in a society, for community health. But then you would see that compared even to a river, when a river was rushing by, and the agriculture and the crops and the abundant life that would come in such a place. The picture here is that you bring Jesus a well, but he brings you a river. Jesus is able to offer us living water, the rushing river of his spirit, his very presence that he brings to pour into us and unite us with himself as his church. This raises the question, where do we go when we're thirsty? Where do you go when you're thirsty? Maybe, like this woman, it's been romantic relationships. We're gonna read she's had five husbands and now on the sixth, but I love as one commentator, Paul Miller, puts it, he says, Um, It's like she's been going to the same well over and over again in these romantic relationships, but they keep leaving her thirsty and dry. Or maybe for you, the well is substances in a way that can lead to addiction when we go to those trying to numb the pain. Or perhaps it's distraction, zoning out on Instagram. So sometimes I think we're, you know, kind of scrolling through other people's lives to avoid dealing with the pain or the emptiness that we can feel in our own. Where do you go when you're thirsty? The reality is options like these often leave us thirstier. I remember being a kid and I was really thirsty one day and so I went running to the fridge and I kind of swung open the fridge door. I was gonna get some cold water and I saw, oh dude, we got soda, right? Like we got Sprite or whatever it was. And so I pulled out the Sprite. I'm like, that sounds yummy. And so I poured a big glass and I drunk it down like, oh, go, 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 go. And afterwards I was like, I'm still thirsty. <laughs> so I poured more, go, 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 still thirsty. So I tried once more, still thirsty. And then my mom came in and saw me and, and she was laughing. She explained, she's like, well, yeah, soda doesn't quench your thirst. It actually makes you thirstier. Like it feels in the short term, like it's satiating something, but in the bigger picture, it's not quenching your thirst. It's ultimately making you thirstier. And there are many things, I believe today, that offer us kind of that short-term satisfaction, but in the long run can end up leaving us feeling even thirstier than before. Our world is filled with cheap substitutes for the life-giving presence of God. I read an article once called uh, Where Coke is Cheaper Than Water on places in the world where uh, it's hard to get people to drink clean water at times and sometimes because Coke was actually cheaper. It was easier to get, it cost less money and all. And I think in our culture, it's often like that. There are substitutes that seem cheaper, easier, quicker in the short term, but they can leave us feeling thirstier, emptier in the long term. As the early church father Augustine says, God, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in me. That often we are searching for fulfillment, searching for something to quench the thirst, but the ultimate one who can truly fulfill our deepest thirsts and longings is Jesus. Jesus is the thirst quencher. Can someone say thirst quencher? He can quench your greatest thirst. Like Jesus is greater than Gatorade, right? Like he is more refreshing than iced tea. We go to different drinks for different reasons. Jesus can wake you up better than coffee. He brings a bigger celebration than Cabernet, right? And Jesus can hit your sweet tooth better than Coke. And it's free, right? So Jesus comes and brings us this living water to quench your greatest thirst. And how does Jesus provide this living water for his bride? Well, I want to draw your attention here to something that really struck me this week. It was, I was like, man, cool. This is amazing. It's a, 
How does Jesus provide living water for his bride? Well, I mentioned earlier that there's some echoes in this passage. When Jesus sits down by the well, that echoes Moses. Uh, when he asks, give me a drink, that echoes Rebecca's story. Um, but when he, when he says Jacob's well, the location where that, that's probably the biggest glowing neon lights. Like, hey, this is Jacob's well. And we go back to the story of Jacob's well. There's something really interesting that takes place in how Jacob provides water for Rachel. Jacob shows up at the well, and before Rachel is there, there's a problem. So he looks at the well, he observes that there was a great heavy boulder, a large rock sitting over the mouth of the well. Then when he sees Rachel coming, though, and they lock eyes and his jaw drops and he's head over heels, what does Jacob do next? Well, Genesis 29.10 tells us that Jacob came near and rolled the stone away. Jacob came near and rolled the stone away. Church, how did Jesus provide living water for his bride? He came near. He drew near to us in our condition. That he wanted to bring us this life-giving water, but we were dead in the wilderness of our trespasses and sins. And so Jesus came near. He drew near so near that he joined to us in the wilderness of our grave. This tight, constricted, dark place that probably felt like a well. And yet, on the third day, church, Jesus rolled the stone away. Jesus rolled the stone away to bring living water for his bride. At this place where the groom and the bride meet, the cross and the resurrected tomb where Christ has conquered sin, death, and the grave, and he has rolled the stone away to pour out his very presence into you and I, his spirit that can satiate our deepest thirsts, that can quench our greatest longings to be united as the bride with the very life of God. This is our story, church, the story of living water encountered in union the God of the universe who has come for us in Christ. All right, let's move to the final movement here in verse 16. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you've had five husbands and the one you now have is not your husband. What you've said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I, who speak to you, am he. We find here that Jesus is the seventh husband. Jesus is the seventh husband. Let me explain what I mean by that. Jesus asked her, go call your husband. And she says, I have no husband. So she goes, hey, give me this water. He's like, well, go call your husband. She's like, I have no husband. And Jesus, we see, touches a nerve here. Because up to this point, uh, all of her responses have averaged around 32 words. And here she drops to four, right? Short, blunt, I have no husband. Up to this point, uh, Jesus' tone has been kind of playful. Her tone has been a bit sassy. It's been kind of this endearing exchange back and forth. But now she seems to draw back. And sometimes when Jesus draws close, we pull back. Especially when he draws close to maybe a sensitive area, an area where we have been wounded, we can recoil defensively. Are we willing to let him into the hard places, to the parched and barren places, to the hurting places? Well, Jesus tells her, uh, you're right. You've had five husbands, you're on your sixth, but he, he won't even marry you. And when we hear this, these kind of six husbands, we often think um, that maybe she's been immoral. And there may be some associations like that, but more likely for early audiences hearing this, what they heard in her was that she was someone who had endured tragedy, someone who had endured great tragedy. 
Because in the ancient Near East, you weren't allowed to, women weren't allowed to divorce their husbands in that region of the world. And so it's not like she's been the one leaving or walking away. The assumptions back in the day would probably be that she had been uh, widowed, that maybe her first husband died, or that she had been left. Perhaps second husband ran away with after another woman. And to have had two or three husbands would be possible, though even they're kind of stretching it, but to have six in that day and age would have been unheard of, a sense of extreme. And so she has likely been wounded and sees herself as unwanted and probably fairly isolated. Some speculate the reason that she's there at noon is because often uh, the women in this culture would go to the well early in the morning in the cool of the day to draw water. And then later, in the, that was, they wouldn't have to come in the heat of the afternoon when the sun was up and it was hot. And so she may be going, not wanting to run into others, not run into the gossips and people of the community. And the reality is that Jesus meets you in your tragedy, church, and in your isolation. Christ has come for us in the parched, dry, barren, and thirsty places of our life. Jesus meets you in your tragedy, in the midst of your spouse who walked away, leaving you holding the keys and the baby bottle and the bills to pay. Jesus shows up to meet you in your diagnosis of multiple sclerosis and all of those things that you love to do and want to do and are no longer able to do. Jesus meets you in the heartache of the loved one who died too soon. We discover here that the king of the universe has seen your tears. He knows your parched, dry, and thirsty heart, and he comes to meet you by the well. Well, she, understandably, changes the subject to religion. Right? This is what your counselor might call deflection. Right? She's like, well, hey, you guys say we're supposed to worship on this mountain, but we worship on this mountain, and which one's right? And uh, she changes the subject to religion. And I found over the years that sometimes, not always, but sometimes our religious questions can be a smokescreen for our heart, right? I can't tell you how many counseling situations I've been in where someone comes in for counsel and a little bit later, you know, come to find like the question is not really the question, right? So someone may come in going, man, God, I'm trying to understand what's going on in this verse of scripture. And the real deeper question, once we peel back the layers, is God, do you see me in my pain? Or on the flip side, someone who comes in is like, man, I just, I, I can't believe in a God anymore who would dot, 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 dot. And then we peel back the layers and find out a few months later, oh, you've been having an affair for the last year. And got this, suddenly got this big religious question, right? So sometimes we have real questions. It's good to grapple with the Bible, but sometimes our religious questions can be a smokescreen for our heart. And the beauty of the gospel here is that Jesus says the Father is not looking for worshipers who worship her in spirit and in fake, right? He says he's looking for worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth, that we can bring him the vulnerability of who we really are, where we're really at, what we've really been through, and he wants to encounter us in the truth of who we are, and he wants to speak his truth into those areas of his life, of our life. <clears throat> and yet, Jesus still honors her question. So this question of which mountain, which one's right, that mountain or this mountain? What, what, what's going on there? Well, the mountain is temple imagery. So the Samaritans worshiped on Mount Gerizim. They had their temple up at the top there. And the Jewish people worshiped on Mount Zion or Jerusalem, where the temple was up on top there. And in the kind of biblical imagery, uh, the temple, it kind of goes, dude, the temple is up on the heights. It's the place where heaven and earth connect on top of the mountain. And then the mountain comes down. And when God shows up, his rivers of living water, we see in the biblical story, are supposed to come running and streaming down the mountain. And so she's asking, which one is it? Is it Mount Gerizim or is it Mount Jerusalem, right? And Jesus, he honors Jerusalem and Israel's history saying, we, we worship what we know, um, you worship what you don't know, but the time is coming and has now come. What he's referring to is himself. The implicit message here is that Jesus is the new mountain. 
Like Jesus is the mountain, the place where we come to truly encounter God the Father. Jesus is the temple where heaven and earth are reconciled. Jesus is the mountain exalted to the right hand of God over all of heaven and earth. And Jesus is the thirst quencher who brings his rivers of living water flowing down into all the earth, into the wastelands and the wilderness to bring forth new life through the presence and the power of his rushing spirit. Jesus is the new mountain. And Jesus declares to her here, implicitly at least, that he is the seventh husband. What I mean by that is he tells her, she talks about the Messiah or the Christ, he says, I who speak to you am he. The groom pulls back the veil to reveal himself to his bride. It's interesting, this is the only place in John's gospel where Jesus comes right out and tells anyone who he is. It says that he's the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. The only other place, actually, the one other, is before the high priest, just before his crucifixion, where he says it to those who are about to kill him. And yet here, he reveals it to her, this Samaritan woman at the well, for the purpose of intimacy, to draw her in, letting her know who he is. The church are those who have seen Christ for who he really is, revealed as the savior of the world and the savior of you. Church, Jesus is the seventh husband who comes and can fulfill the deepest longings. Where others may have abused you, abandoned you, betrayed you, Jesus says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'm not going anywhere. I will be with you through thick and thin. I will lay down my life for you, to be with you forever. Jesus, man, I think we're supposed to see here, it's like it's a betrothal type scene where Jesus says, I am coming for you. I am crossing every boundary and I am doing it to quench your thirst and to unite you with you, me forever. Christ and the church, his people united, the wedding feast of the lamb, the purpose of creation is that you and I would find ourselves satiated and overjoyed in the presence of Christ forever and his kingdom come. Amen. So the invitation this morning, as we come to worship, as we come to communion, the invitation is to Jesus, the boundary-crossing, thirst-quenching, stone-rolling, seventh husband. We come to Jesus who has already come for us. He's already come here for us. Sometimes the place where a couple first meets is significant. The place where he first met us is the place where he wants to still meet you today. As we come to worship, I want to invite you to bring him your Samaria. Bring him your dry and thirsty places. Bring him the places where you have felt rejected and distant, isolated and alone. Bring these places to Christ. Don't feel like you got to cover over with the superficial and the fake. He invites us to worship with the spirit and truth. So as we come to communion this morning, I want to invite you to take the elements and the bread and the wine, a sign of Christ's body given, his blood shed, the depths that he was ultimately willing to go, the boundaries he was ultimately willing to cross to hell and back to be with us as his people. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, these elements are for you. I want to invite you to take the bread, a sign of his body given for us This is people laying down his life for his bride. Let's receive bread. And now, let's take the wine or the juice here, a sign of his blood poured out and shed to unite himself with us forever. We receive the wine. And church, if you would now stand and we together in one voice, we want to sing the praise of Christ. Again, our boundary crossing, thirst quenching, stone rolling, seventh husband. Would you join me in prayer?